Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, everybody. My name's Polly, and I'm an alcoholic. Hi. And I had to be a brat first thing out of the chute. And uh, I just did it because this is always what I say at my discussion meetings. And, and uh, Bill says, well, who wants to go first? And he comes up to me and he says, well, you're going to go first and then Pete and then Lorna. And I said, well, there's nothing I hate worse than being first. And then Lorna says, not to worry, I'll lead the pack. And then I go back and I say, but my grandbaby's here. He may not can sit an hour and a half. Can I go first? <laughs> <laughs> There is not enough words to say what a privilege it is to be able to be a part of this convention. I can't describe to you the feeling I had uh, when I came home uh, the night my husband opened up the letter and he said, uh, I was sitting, he just said, he pulled out the dining room table and he said, Polly, sit down. And, uh, and then he told me that I'd been invited to be one of the speakers at the International Convention. And uh, I just can't even begin to tell you what an honor that is. And uh, I love Alcoholics Anonymous, and I love being sober. And there is not anything in this world that I would not do for the program of Alcoholics Anonymous because this program has done so much for me. And I'm really grateful that I feel that way today because it is the program of Alcoholics Anonymous that has given me everything that I have in my life today. And I don't know who you're here with this weekend, but I have the treasures of my life with me this weekend. And uh, I'd like to introduce my husband, Dave. My son, James, my daughter-in-law, Kelly, and the joy of my life, Ryan David. <laughs> the miracle is, is that Ryan is two years old, and he's at his first international. <laughs> he was four days old when he was in his first AA meeting. Because, you see, his daddy's 11 years sober, and his mom is 6 years sober. And that's... <laughs> when I came to the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, I had destroyed the lives of my children. And um, I just want to talk a lot about family and friends, because this is about the language of the heart. I want you to know that I'm a bad alcoholic. The disease of alcoholism got me pronounced dead on arrival. And because of a program called Alcoholics Anonymous, you have breathed life into me. And today, I feel so much love, I can barely, barely stand it. I've been telling everybody, I'm going to be levitating by the end of the weekend. <laughs> I am absolutely going to be levitating by the end of the weekend because I've been given the privilege in Alcoholics Anonymous to be able to go and share at different places. And just in this room this morning, I've got friends from Vancouver to Alaska to New York. I mean, it's just like... I can't believe that what Alcoholics Anonymous has given to me. And in this room, I have my husband's sponsor. My sponsor has had a stroke, and she couldn't make it, and her husband died about six months ago. So they're not here, but Frank is here. And in this room, I have the privilege of having a lot of the women I sponsor, and that's the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. You gave me the language of the heart, and it was that language, because I believe that Alcoholics Anonymous is a program of where the heart speaks and the heart listens. And I was talking to my daughter-in-law yesterday, and I said, I am so grateful for a gift I have, and that gift is, is the heart that God has given me, the heart that today is capable of loving and the heart that is capable of being loved. 
because when I came to the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, I would have sworn to you that nobody loved me. Yet the reality was is that the only person who didn't love me was me. I had taken these two little lives of my two sons, and the disease of alcoholism had torn them apart. But those two little boys loved me, and the forgiveness in their heart has been beyond my greatest expectation. The family and the friends I had loved me, and it's you who taught me through the language of the heart to be able to receive that love, because what I couldn't do is receive that love. My sons tried to hurt themselves. One son I had tried to kill himself time after time through desperation and heartbreak, and he's not an alcoholic. My youngest son tried to destroy his life behind alcohol and drugs, and today none of that's like that. I need to talk to you a little bit about Ryan. Two years ago in May, on May the 23rd, we got this the most beautiful gift that uh, God could give a person, and that was this beautiful child. And I, I have literally found out why you have kids. So you can have grandkids. <laughs> and I love this little boy with all my heart. And uh, about seven or eight months ago, we found out that Ryan's deaf. And, you know, here's one more time I'm shaking my fist at God and saying, you know, how can this be? How can this be? I mean, we, you know, how can this happen to this precious little boy? But, see, I truly believe that the disease of alcoholism is a disease of perception, that my perception of reality is distorted. I have no idea what the truth is. I have only my perception. And I am so grateful today that my, my perception of reality is different. Because you see, here's two families that were torn apart by a disease called alcoholism. Because you see, Kelly comes from that too. But because of this little boy, and because of what he has to, ch what his challenges are in life, you've got a whole family that's coming together and we're all learning sign language, and we're learning that so we can communicate with this little boy, and we're together, and a family gets to heal. And we didn't even know that seven or eight months ago. The miracle of the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. Now, I'm going to uh, steal a portion of my son James's talk. Uh... One of the things that I want for Alcoholics Anonymous is I want Alcoholics Anonymous to be here exactly the way it was here for me. I want... I want the program of Alcoholics Anonymous to be here exactly as it was for James when he needed to come here. Because you see, folks... I need for you to protect our program, and I need for you to keep the program of Alcoholics Anonymous exactly as it is in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> because I think Ryan's going to need you. <laughs> uh, when you're a little bitty baby and you have to have a lot of tests run, uh, they have to give you a lot of medication because they have to put you out. Well, we take Ryan to get his uh, test done, and they give him some medication. Nothing happens. <laughs> they do it a second time. Nothing happens. They give it a third time, and Ryan finally goes out. And Ryan comes to doing this. That's more in sign language. <laughs> I need for you to be here. And I need for us to make sure that we protect and love the program that's so beautiful and that was here for all of us. Dave and I... And I can share this. You know, there's a part in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous that talks about there is a principle that will keep a man forever in ignorance, 
and that principle is contempt prior to investigation. Now, I want to tell you that it's not that I don't believe in therapy, and it's not that I don't believe in a lot of stuff, because I do. But I just need to tell you about a quest that Dave and I went on. And I don't have to do contempt prior to investigation, because this is my experience, so I'm not talking out of the side of my mouth. But Dave and I went on this quest for our inner child. (laughs) We just knew if we found this, that this would be the answer for us. Now, I'm not talking about therapy and stuff that we do to help our marriages and stuff. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about trying to find answers to what's wrong. Well, I found the answer, and I'm here to share it with you. That my answer for me is, is I don't need to find my inner child. What I am desperately trying to do at 55 years old is find an adult. And I don't know about anybody else who's my age, but it is what an order I can't go through with it to, to try to do adolescence and menopause all at the same time. <laughs> the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous talks about great events will come to pass. And... Um, I'd like to share in this short amount of time a lot of my great events that have come to pass. I came to the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous pronounced dead on arrival. The disease of alcoholism had taken my life. The disease of alcoholism had destroyed my marriage. The disease of alcoholism had destroyed my children. And this program... In the past 18 years, and you know something I forgot to do, and I got sober in Texas, and I don't ever want to forget to do this, because in Texas we say if you don't give your sobriety date, it's probably because you don't have one. (laughs) And my sobriety date is April the 11th of 1977, and for that I am truly grateful. Thanks. (laughs) In the past 18 years... So many great events have come to pass. I have a husband who, who loves me beyond anything I could have possibly understood. And Dave has been my lesson in unconditional love. Because I will assure you that when I came to the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, alcoholism was not my only problem, I will assure you. I was trying to find love in all the wrong places. <laughs> And I suffered so much shame through my sexual acting out. I just knew that if you just loved me enough, that I'd be fine. And I had no idea what love was about. So I had a lot, I did a lot of things in my early sobriety that I am so ashamed of. And Dave has known me since I was six months sober. And Dave looked at me with all the love in his heart, and he said, Polly, I love you, but you need to get something straight. I don't want to have an affair with you. I want to marry you. And he gave me love beyond my greatest expectation. And that's a great event that has come to pass. I have two sons, and I was not a good parent. And I have had to get before my sons and make amends because I was a child abuser. I took from my children their most valuable, the most valuable thing they have in life, and that is their self-worth and their self-esteem because of a disease called alcoholism. And today, sitting in a room in San Diego, California, is my son, my daughter-in-law, and their child, sober in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. And that is a great event that has come to pass. My oldest son tried to take his life six times. And there was a couple of times he nearly made it. And my son has not tried to hurt himself in seven years. And he's married to a wonderful woman. And that's a great event that's come to pass. I have friends today 
beyond my greatest expectation. And that's a great event that's come to pass. My life today is beyond my greatest expectation. The big book of Alcoholics Anonymous tells me, left to me, I would have settled for so much less. The big book of Alcoholics Anonymous has given me a God beyond my greatest expectation. Because you see, besides being a recovering alcoholic and drug addict, I am a recovering Southern Baptist. And I had (laughs) no idea about God. The God I had was this punishing God that absolutely would never, ever love me. And there was no way I could ever be enough for God. And tonight, this morning, I'm wearing a pen that says, God's kid. And down in my heart, I know without a shadow of a doubt that I am God's kid. And that's a great event that's come to pass. Now, I don't know if any of you are sensitive. <laughs> but I got to tell you about my sensitive joke, my sensitive experience. It's not a joke. This is the absolute truth. My name is Polly. It's not Pauline or Paula. It's Polly. Now, if you're a little girl and your name is Polly, you're going to be teased a lot. Now, I don't know if you're sensitive, but I don't like to be teased, and I don't like to be laughed at. And it was things like, Polly wants a cracker, and Polly Wally doodle all the day. (laughs) But I know that this is a disease of perception. And today I know that it's only my perception that makes me think that it's bad. Because, you see, it's great to have a name like Polly. Because with all these people in this room, I'm probably the only Polly. This is not very many Polly's in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. I didn't know I was an alcoholic, and I used to drive down the freeways in Dallas, Texas, and I used to pray to God to have heart disease or cancer or something because I wanted to die of something respectable. And today I know that the disease of alcoholism is my greatest gift because if I didn't have the disease of alcoholism, I wouldn't qualify for the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. And everything I am or hope to be, I owe to this fellowship. It'll be 15 years in October that Dave and I have been married. And and Dave's last name is Pistol. My name is now... Now, I'm here to tell you, we got a rule around here called Rule 62. You are not going to walk on planet Earth with a name like Polly Pistol and not learn to lighten up. (laughs) I have about six minutes, and I want to share that six minutes with uh, five years ago. We were all sitting around... We had a great bed and breakfast in, uh, in Old Town, and we were sitting around and we were all just reminiscing about uh, five years ago. Five years ago, James and Kelly and Dave and I met in Seattle. James and Kelly weren't married. And now they're married today, and they have Ryan. And what a difference. Teddy and EJ are here this morning. And they were married, and they're married, and they're here in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. And we had some friends, I don't know if, uh, if she's here this morning, and they were there, and they were married, and they're not married. <laughs> <laughs> and I have to tell this little joke about on Carol and Bob, because I always tell Carol that I think her love story is the most exciting I've ever heard. Because, you see, Bob uh, came to the Seattle um, international, and he came with a broken heart because just about before he came to the international, he and his ex-wife had split. And so Bob and I started taking a walk every morning, and we shared that that hour or so together, and we talked, and we got to really be good friends. And um, and all I have to tell you this: my husband, who is a rock climber and a backpacker, was in a wheelchair. 
because of his back. And, uh, and he's not there today. He's sitting here and, and, uh, he climbs rocks. And, uh, Dave was sitting in his wheelchair and we were all out here with the rag a band. And, uh, Dave looked up at this balcony and there was this cute little blonde up there with a big white bow in her hair. And Dave looked at Bob and he said, Bob, there's God's will for you. <laughs> <laughs> and I bet she has 30 days. <laughs> well, as alcoholics will do, we gathered all together and we decided to go have a meeting in Bob's room. And Carol and her girlfriend by now had come down to join the crowd. And so Carol was in there, and here's this little gal from Oklahoma, and she's sitting there, and she says, Hi, my name's Carol, and I have 30 days. <laughs> in San Diego, for the 60th, they're married. <laughs> Great events will come to pass. I have a relationship today with a God that is beyond my greatest expectation. I came here and I absolutely knew that there was no way I would ever be enough. And I'm here to tell you that 18 years later, I don't always feel like I'm enough. And I know today that if I'll just keep suiting up and showing up one day at a time, one day at a time, if I can get my words out. Um, I'll become closer to God, and I'll become closer to being enough. And there are days when I feel that, that I am enough. And I'm here to tell you right now, at this moment, there is not one doubt in my mind that I am God's kid and that I am enough. I am so grateful to be a sober member of the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm so grateful to have been privileged to be able to be a part of an international convention. And I was told, Polly, if you want the secret to Alcoholics Anonymous, if you want the secret to what makes you feel good all the time. I was told by a man who loved me, who was my first AA sponsor, he said, Polly, get into service. Get into service if you want to feel good all the time. So if you're fit, sitting here in a room tonight and you wonder why you don't have the magic, what happened to the magic? And I know today that the more I serve the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, the more I serve God. Because you see, the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous tells me what my purpose is. It tells me that my purpose is to be of maximum service to God and the people about me. And today I know that that's my purpose, is to be of maximum service to God and the people about me. When I came to the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, I wanted to die. And today you have breathed life into me, and you have given me all the things that I ever wanted in life. I ended up in a real fancy jitter joint in Dallas, Texas on April the 11th of 1977. And every day, one of the counselors used to start our meetings with a prayer. And I like to end my talks with that prayer because it's what the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous means to me. I sought my God, my God, I could not see. I sought my soul, my soul eluded me. I sought my brother, and I found all three. Thank you. God bless. I love you.
was worried. We could hit her out there while she was talking. Sound, well, please quiet down. Sit down, please. We can close the door back there. Probably burn that wire right out. Okay, well, we're running behind anyway, so uh, don't make any difference. I don't want our speakers to rush. Pete, our next speaker is Pete E. from West Virginia. Peter. My God, I got to follow Polly. <laughs> She was a powerful speaker, wasn't she? I'm a Presbyterian. I'm really not a Southern Baptist. But this preacher, who was a Southern Baptist, was a powerful speaker. And he was speaking in a church that had a mezzanine. So one of the women came so enthralled with what he was saying, she leaned over the railing and fell out. <laughs> and her dress caught on the chandelier. And the good preacher said, He who casts his eyes upward shall go stone blind. <laughs> There was a man there sitting just below her. And before church, he had a drink or two. And he looks up, and he closed one eye, and he said, I believe I'll chance one eye. My name is Pete Ellis, and I'm an alcoholic. Actually, my name is not Pete. My name is Harold. And of all the people in this room uh, today, I can think of only two people who know what my first name is. I want to introduce my wife, who, by the way, is a past delegate of Alabama. Jackie. And her good friend from Stewart, Florida, Roberta V. I came into the program, my sobriety date was September the 23rd, 1975. And when I came in, they, they didn't have the 12 questions as we have them now. So I made a few thoughts out for myself. And here they are. See if they'll help you. Have you ever had the roof of your mouth sunburn? Have you ever been arrested while you were in jail? <laughs> because of one thing that happened to me, I had to spend a day in jail. And this, this boy, or man, came in and he was working for the sheriff. And he told the sheriff, I can't work for you tomorrow. I'm going home. I said, no, you can't. Your wife just got another one for you. So he fits this one. The next one. Have you ever been, have you ever been run over by your own car while driving it? <laughs> have you ever woke up with a circus midget in bed with you? Have you ever done a Tennessee walk to the straight jacket? <laughs> oh, I love this because I love Alan. Has your Alan ever dropped the electric cord in the bathtub with you? <laughs> Have you 
Have you ever been so nervous that you could lay in bed at night and listen to your hair grow? <laughs> and finally, and I love this one too. By the way, this is not original and somebody else gave it to me. Have you ever woke up in, in the morning feeling rather delicately and lose your glasses and brush your teeth with preparation H? <laughs> of 14 children. My mother had 14 children. I was the sixth one. Eleven of us are still living. My mother's still living. She'll be 97 if she reaches the, if she lives till October 24th. You know, when I was, I drank for 27 years. And during this, I really, actually, I was like the uh, Niagara Falls. First, I was just a drop, and then I finally went over the falls. Because actually, when I first started drinking, I enjoyed it. Man, I could jitterbug. Now I can hardly bug. <laughs> But I'd do anything for liquor. I was in the school business. I was superintendent of schools. Just think of a drunk superintendent of the schools. We were holding a convention in Beckley, West Virginia. And I ran out of liquor. Oh, lordy, I was nervous. So I went down... You know how you can look in the uh, windows of the uh, hotel room, or motel room, and there I saw the gift of heaven, two fifths of liquor. I didn't even stay at that hotel. That's where the meetings were. I called the maid. I said, honey, I'm in room 225. And I locked my key in the room. She opened it and I stole somebody's liquor. She said, I said, now look, that's worth ten dollars. She said, no, but that's worth twenty. <laughs> so I gave it to her. Also, I became a physician in my time. I hardly know what an aspirin is. We went on this trip, me and a fellow worker, and we stopped at a motel about two o'clock in the morning. And the woman came out, said, what's your name? Remember the speed out? I said, Dr. Miller. <laughs> oh, doctor, I feel awful. I was about three or four drunks. I said, honey, I can tell it. Why don't you go back in there and bring me your pills out and let me look at them? <laughs> she brought out about seven or eight pa uh, bottles of pills. Oh, I know exactly what to do with you. The man who's with me is the expert on it. But I can take care of it. Throw seven bottles of pills away. Double the dose on the one bottle that you're taking. And go to bed over and you'll feel better. She said, but doctor, I already feel better. I said, by God, you ought to. She said, what do I do? I said, would fifty dollars be too much? <laughs> what foolish things we do. What is the language of the heart? The language of the heart to me is love. Language of the heart are our slogans and our steps. Language of the heart and the most thing and the best thing that kept me sober was working with others. 
And I do think, too, the language of the heart is listening to others. My sobriety is as hinged a whole lot on listening to what you say and not what I say. I spend seven months in Florida and five months in West Virginia. On May the 23rd of 1994, I had a serious operation. The people around me wanted me to go to Gainesville to a special hospital. But I went to see the doctor that was going to operate on me. And I don't know why. I believe it's my God of my understanding. I said to this man, easy does it. And he said to me, I'm one of you. I said, go to it. <laughs> and I'm fine. And I've lost 50 pounds. I started, I didn't start drinking until I was 22 years old. I came in, as I said, in 1975. But I drank two or three fifths a day. I too tried to kill myself. I don't know how many Valium I took with liquor. And thank God I uh, am living today. As, I fur as my disease further progressed, I got more dangerous in the things that I did. So, if you buy as much liquor as I did, every bootlegger in the county knows you. And being a public figure, I couldn't, uh, I had to go to other places to get my uh, liquor. <coughs> the stores in the uh, state of West, you couldn't buy them like you can now in, uh, in, uh, in drug stores and things like that. You had to buy them in the state store. But I knew this lady real well, and I went up and asked her if she would open, open the store for me and get me a pint of liquor. And she did. It was about 8 o'clock in the morning. I drank that pint of liquor. This is where God is with me, I know. No one can tell me there is no God. In a blackout, I hit a truck with two kids beside of it. Didn't even know I did it. Cross over the road, hit an end loader with a man on it. Cross over the road and hit a gas tank. Cross over the road and hit a bridge. Doing 65 miles an hour in a white Cadillac with four flat tires. Being in the school system, I worked with the state police, the local police, and the, uh, the city police. They knew me. In my drinking period, I bet at least they took me home 15 times. But thank God this time they didn't. And I was also lucky, too, that the state police didn't get me, because they really wanted to get me, and I don't blame them. A deputy got me. So they took me to the police station. The state police wanted to get me for hit and run. But there was a man that's in the school system who was a justice of the peace, and my good wife got him right away, and he got, he got me under bond. The woman whose truck I hit with two kids beside of it was going to press charges for hit and run. Here again, I thank God, came into my life. Because we had a secretary in our office that lived next door to this woman. And she told her, whatever, Pete Ellis, whatever, whatever you want, Pete Ellis will do. And she didn't press the charge. 
I was never in a treatment center. I'm very fortunate. I have not had a drink since the day I stopped. I went to the hospital. And the doctor said, I can't put you in here for being drunk. I said, put me in here for sugar diabetes. And from that point, in front of the hospital, I called Alcoholics Anonymous. The first man, and this to me too, shows the strength of the God as I understand it. He didn't live at that time in Charleston. He said, yes, I know how he looks too. I said, my God, man, he's the best friend I've got in New Valley. And Harry was Bob's sponsor. Bob became my first sponsor. After that, I never have had a drink until this day. But they sentenced me to a night in jail. Now, I'm sure there's no one in this room that's ever been in jail. <laughs> I, had to, I went in at 10 o'clock. I was supposed to get out. I was supposed to send a day. When I went in there, they didn't like me. But there was a man there when I was a teenager who lived, he was a cook, and he lived next door to me. So they talked to him, and I, then I immediately got rapport with him. But the next morning, I called my wife, and the jailer said, why don't you tell her to come and get you? Remember now, it was seven in the morning. So she came and got me. When I got home, the JP called me, said, somebody saw you leave at seven. Get your rear end back here. You've got to stay at ten. Some people can get nosy with us drunks, can't they? I immediately got into service in Alcoholics Anonymous after about a year or two. <laughs> I have a master's degree plus 30, almost a doctorate degree. When I first came in the AA, I couldn't even read. I've been in, in the state of West Virginia, I was the grapevine chairman. The grapevine chairman in those days was Reetha Gresham, and I was on the program in New Orleans in 1980 with Reetha. Ann Warner is now the uh, grapevine chairman. After that, I was elected to the, uh, I was elected treasurer of the state of West Virginia. You really don't have to be there. You really don't have to have those type of office to help other people. But it gives you a chance to meet people throughout the, uh, the state. And in 1982, I was elected delegate. for the state of West Virginia. I served the years of 1983 and 80, 80, 84. Bill came after I did on panel 35. People wanted to say, hey, you've got the preamble. I don't know whether you know where the preamble came from or not. But during World War II, during World War II, the great guy wanted to send her, uh, wanted to mail her magazine overseas free, and they couldn't. First office wouldn't allow him. And they asked him why. And they said, you don't say what you are. Therefore, it was the birth of the preamble. What is AA? It is what the preamble says, but I'm added to it. And it's very serious. AA is a spirit that cannot be touched, nor can it completely be understood. It is wide as a world, very small enough to fit snugly into the hearts and minds of man. 
To the interest it has given wisdom, to the wise tolerance, it has given to all that which is most precious. It's giving the love of truth, one, and the love of life from enough left over to share with each other. I'm really used to talking an hour, but I'm going to finish this right now. The big book, Alcoholics Anonymous, is our textbook. And if you follow a textbook, I think you should go from the first page to the last. But sometimes I think that reading the last paragraph on page 164 would be good for a beginner. And this is the way it goes. Abandon yourself to God as you understand God. Admit your thoughts to him and to your fellows. Clear away the wreckage of your past. Give freely of what you find and join us. We shall be with you in the fellowship of the Spirit, and you will surely meet some of us as you trudge the road of happy destiny. May God bless you and keep you until then. People, there is no one in this world that I like more than a good drunk that's sober. I sponsored a hell of a lot of them that were drunk when they came in. All of them have got sober, but some of them have. Thank you very much. This happens to be my fourth international. Thank you very much. Would you please sit down? Let me have some quiet. We have another speaker. Give some silence, please. Our next speaker is Lorna Kay from New York. Lorna? Good morning, everyone. My name is Lorna, and I'm an alcoholic. I think I, I'm always still so surprised when I, I, I announce my name and I, I announce that I'm an alcoholic and uh, that people respond and they say, Hi, Lorna. I, I think even after all these years, I, I expect you to say, No. <laughs> Can't be. A nice girl like you? It's not true. Um, I, I'm going to make another announcement now and maybe you'll get it right. Uh, this time. Um, in a few weeks' time, I'm going to be 50 years old. That's better. Well, uh, this topic, uh, language of the heart. Oh, I have a lot to say about it. Um, when I was 15 years sober, uh, I had my heart mangled. Um, I had uh, I met my Waterloo in sobriety, and uh, I just had you know one of those dreadful piercings of the heart, and uh, I hit my wall, and everything went out the window. All the tools that I ever had uh, learned in sobriety, the big book. <laughs> Uh, my sponsees turned into my sponsors. Um, I couldn't read or write or meditate or pray or do anything. And it, it came about through a loss, which is always the thing that I think, you know, sends us to plummeting to our uh, spiritual bottoms. And um, the only thing God left me with was smart feet. And my feet took me to meetings, and I screamed, and I cried, and I carried on. And there's no one sort of on the east coast of America, on the west coast, uh, in India, or anywhere, that doesn't know that Lorna was going through her excruciating pain. And someone came up to me once, and she said to me, God, I'm so sick of you and your pain, she said. Someone came up to me in a meeting in London and said, how's Lorna and her pain? (laughs) 
Anyway, uh, <laughs> this language of the heart business. Uh, they say, you know, this this thing of, uh, I know that I probably get assassinated in Alcoholics Anonymous for this, but um, uh, the, the big book claims that it is the textbook of uh, Alcoholics Anonymous, and uh, that might be so. It might be so. But uh, I believe that the, I see Sarah sitting in the front row here, I believe that uh, the textbook of Alcoholics Anonymous is written on the hearts and in the experience of its individual members, and it is not solid. It is not something that is absolutely written down and there and contained. It's something that's fluid and, and flowing and forever changing. And it is said, you know, that the, that the mind, I cannot, I didn't get this thing through my mind. It is said that, uh, and we know, that, it, that Alcoholics Anonymous, we don't get it through our brains. The message is given to us through our hearts. And it is said that the, the mind is Satan's lawyer, and the heart is God's servant. And, uh, pardon those of you that are in the legal profession, but... Um, <laughs> uh, the, <laughs> and it is, it is the language of the heart, and... We all know that, uh, you know, when we, when we separate from people, when we're angry at people, we shout because the hearts are separated and we yell at each other. And the closer we become, the softer and the quieter we speak until we have great intimacy and no words are necessary. And, um, when I was going through this excruciating pain of mine, I, uh, I really wanted my mother. I mean, you can imagine how terrible it was if I wanted to go home to my mother. And um, my mother had uh, passed away. And so I went to my next mother. I'm very friendly with Mother Teresa. So I went off to India. And, uh, you know, I'd gone to India many times, and I worked with the lepers and the dying and God knows what. And um, I, uh, this time, I sort of envied, was envying the lepers. I mean, I was in just, it was terrible. And... Um, mother, mother took so much pity on me, and Mother put me up at the orphanage. And uh, she was very, very, very kind to me. She knew that I, I couldn't work, I couldn't do a damn thing. And the following, that was in March, and the following summer, she was in New York. And uh, she said to me, uh, she asked me, how is it going for you? How is it for you? And I said, Mother, it's hell. It's absolute <laughs> hell. And she said, hmm. She said, how God must love you. <laughs> she said, um, and he wants to be very intimate with you, but he is a jealous lover, and he is burning out of your soul everything unlike himself. I know, and I said, well, oh, gee, that's swell, mother, but... Uh, <laughs> I wish he'd stop being quite so passionate here, you know. <laughs> Maybe a little softer message would be uh, good. But uh, I feel that that's what has happened, uh, and uh, we do as we get more and more sober and more and more. I do not believe that Alcoholics Anonymous is a bridge back to life. I don't believe it. Life? <laughs> what life? Really? Um, uh, I believe that Alcoholics Anonymous is a bridge into Alcoholics Anonymous. And I think that this is the great mystery. The, the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous are the mystery of life. And that's, you know, what I want. I, I don't know about you, but I don't want it ordinary. I don't believe any alcoholic that says they're striving for the middle path. Oh, get serious. <laughs> I didn't drop acid because I wanted an ordinary day. Uh, yeah. Really. And uh, I don't want 
it ordinary. I'm not interested in the ordinary. I want, you know, there's something in me, something is given to me that is a great thirst and a great longing and a, a, and a great yearning I have. And just because I've stopped drinking does not mean to say that that urge and that pull and that thirst has stopped. I still have that thirst and that thirst increases and there's only one thing that will satisfy that thirst and that is a spiritual life and a spiritual life in helping others and working in Alcoholics Anonymous. And, um, you know, the greatest words I think that, that we give each other when we come, the greatest words that were given to me are, I know how you feel and let me tell you my story. That was the uh, most incredible thing that that was said, and the most incredible thing. And, you know, I don't want an ordinary life. I mean, uh, you can't talk to an alcoholic about dying. They say, you know, if you don't stop drinking, you'll die. Yeah, 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 but then what, you know? Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know? I'm interested in resurrection. And, uh, and I'm, I, I like resurrection, and I like to raise the dead. Uh, people say, you know, what do you do? Well, uh, the blind see, the deaf hear, the lame walk, and I raise the dead, and I, you know, do a little laundry and fix my nails. What do you do? You know? <laughs> and so... <laughs> anyway, I, I had a, a, a little incident. I think it's all about the heartbreaking. I really do. Um, I, a few weeks ago, I came back. I, I'm always going away on silent retreats. I, there's something about, so I like doing it. Uh, I'm called to it. I think God thinks, you know, would you keep quiet? Just get in here. And um, anyway, I came back from this silent retreat. And when I was on uh, uh, retreat, I was in the 17th day of silence. And I was out doing walking meditation. And then we were going in for a sitting meditation. And before that, I, I needed to go uh, to the bathroom. And I went, walked down some stairs. And... Um, when I came back up the steps, there was a squashed frog on the steps, this tiny baby frog, and uh, he was in a, a pool of blood. And I just, when I bent down, I could see that his innards were out, and he was still alive. And I just felt so dreadful. I realized that when I'd gone down the stairs, I'd trod on him. And, uh, you know, here I was, 17 days in silence, and my heart, I was so sensitive and so vulnerable and so open, and I just practically died. I went in, and I had another, I sat through my hour of meditation, and afterwards it was very unusual, because the teacher said, does anyone have any questions? And I raised my hand, and I shared this incident about this squash frog, and I could hardly get it out. I was so upset and so moved, and it, it just blew me out of the water. And he said, you know, he said, um, now, he said, you know, you're very sensitive, and uh, you understand that when you cause suffering, you harm yourself. And, um, you know, I've heard that before. Jesus said from the cross, you know, forgive them, Father, they know not what they do. I've heard that, but I got it. I got it in my cellular life. I got it in my earlobes. I understood that when I cause suffering, I harm myself, whether intentionally or unintentionally. And I cause suffering, you know, by my actions, by my words, by my deeds, by my unkind gestures, by non-caring, all that sort of thing. So um, I said, I had an interview with that very same teacher a few days later, and I said to him, well, you know, I always thought I'd get my awakening from a prince, but not from a frog, you know. <laughs> and... Uh, but after the retreat was over, the retreat was over about a week after that, and uh, one of the women came up to me and she said, when you shared that in the room, she said, I heard this great creaking in the room as all our hearts sort of mm, opened a little more. Um, they say, you know, we've all been in meetings of alcoholics and all where we're all moaning and whining and carrying on about how we can't stand intimacy, how we're frightened of being intimate with each other. And I really don't think that that's true. That um, I think we're very, very intimate uh, with each other. And 
When Jesus, I love talking about Jesus, it's a great passion of mine, and I think to mention his name in a big crowd is like, ooh, you know. <laughs> you, can, uh, you, know you can say anything in Alcoholics Anonymous, but mention the name Jesus, you can clear the room. Um, so, when, uh, when Jesus was uh, on his cross, it was his big moment. It's what he'd come to do, to offer his life for the uh, redemption of many. And uh, when he was on his cross, first of all, carrying his cross, someone had to help him, and he allowed, and if it had been me, it'd be like, no, look, this is my finest hour. Would you get your hands off my cross? I want to do this all by myself. But um, anyway, crucified with Christ were two other uh, people. And uh, one of them turned to him and said to him, uh, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus did not turn to him and say, Hey, can't you see? I'm in the middle of a big spiritual experience. <laughs> can't you see that I'm busy here? And, uh, you know, you look a right mess. And I mean, maybe I look like I'm in bad shape, but... Give me a few hours and I'm going to be ascending to the Father. And um, I hope you make it, buddy. You know? Uh, he didn't say that at all. He said to that man, This day you will be with me in paradise. He shared his most intimate moment. He didn't say, Well, when you've gone through a few years, I'll give you the key. Um, and when I walked through the doors of Alcoholics Anonymous, wearing the same dress that I'd been wearing for the last three months, festooned in jewelry, gobs of makeup on that I hadn't taken off for months because like I was like Elizabeth I, I just put more on every day. Uh, and I walked in thinking I added great tone and class to Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, you did not say to me, you did not say, well, sister, you're a bit of a mess, you know. Um, actually, we're on the sixth and seventh step. We're very spiritual in here, and, um, you know, we're very busy, and uh, I hope you make it. You didn't say that at all. You said, we know how you feel. These are the steps we took, and you don't have to drink today. Join us. You gave me the entire program, all that I needed to know right then and there. You were intimate and involved with me from the very beginning. I was not cut out. Alcoholics Anonymous is an anonymous program. We are not a secret society. And whatever we have to give is openly given and shared. You don't have to have so many years sober to get it. It's right here, and it's intimately given. And two thousand five hundred years ago, there was a prince on the earth, and he was an Indian prince, and he became the Buddha, and uh, he was determined to find the meaning of life, and he wanted to do that. He wanted to know all about suffering, and he had six years of an ascetic life and he went through all sorts of asceticisms and finally he sat down under the Bodhi tree in Bodh Gaya and he said I'm not moving until I know I'm not getting up from here until I know and he sat down in his posture and he faced all the forces of Mara that came at him all the forces of lust and greed and temptation and uh, all that, all our human stuff was visited upon him. And he sat, and he sat. And finally, Mara, who was the evil one, said to him, Who do you think you are that you can sit there and expect enlightenment? And the Buddha put out his hand, and he touched the earth. And the earth gave witness to him that through all his countless lifetimes, he had had, he was now entitled to sit there and get enlightenment. And I tell that story because 
I believe that to choose the sure thing is treason for the soul. To choose what we know is right eventually will kill us. We have to risk. We have to move in with faith. And we don't, we have to move. You know, Alcoholics Anonymous and living in the third step gives me the ability to leap before I look. I don't have to say, am I going to have enough money in the bank? Is it going to be all right? Will I have a roof over my head? You know, the worst that could happen to me has happened to me. I've already died and I've come in here. So the Buddha didn't choose the sure thing. He sat under that tree and he could have gone back and he could have been in his father's palace and been a prince of the realm. But no, and because he did that, because he faced that, it blasted open all sorts of gates for me and for countless others that want it to take that knowledge and to have that kind of a life. And 500 years after the Buddha sat under that tree, there was another man on the earth, and his name was Jesus. And he didn't choose the sure thing either. You know, he could have gone back in that garden of Gethsemane when he was in the agony in the garden, he could have turned and he could have gone back to Nazareth or Galilee, wherever he was wanted to go, and he could have been a carpenter and had a decent living and gotten married and had his kids and, and all that, but he didn't and he moved forward in faith and, the, and choosing, not choosing the right thing is not what the indication is not always that it's going to be comfortable, you know being comfortable is not always the indication that I've done it right. Very often, the right thing, choose, not choosing the sure thing, is very uncomfortable. So, and because Jesus did not choose the sure thing and go back to uh, a married life and, and a regular, ordinary life, and I'm not saying that a married, regular, ordinary life is wrong. Oh my God, I just heard what I said. Um, <laughs> but... Uh, because he didn't do that, he also blasted open some gates and some doors for mankind. And if I choose, I can go that way. And 2,000 years after Jesus walked the earth, in June of 1935, there was a man called Bill Wilson. And he was in Akron, Ohio. And he was there on business. And the business had not gone very well. And he was six months sober. And he was sort of doing it on his own. He tried to get other people sober and nothing had worked. But he knew he only maintained his sobriety by sharing it with others. And on this gloomy day, at the end of this awful day, he was downstairs in the hotel lobby. And down one end of the lobby was the sure thing. And the sure thing was the bar. And he could hear laughter and people talking. And he knew, as I know, that's the sure thing. I can have a drink and I can get out of this god-awful pain. That's the sure thing. And Bill Wilson turned. He turned. And in that turning, he walked to the other end of the lobby and at the other end of the lobby was the church directory, and he started making phone calls. And because Bill Wilson did that, I and countless others are here today and are all over the world, sober, with a chance. He blasted open doors for thousands of us that should be dead. And, you know, Bill Wilson when he made that turn in that lobby in Akron, Ohio, didn't think, well, this is a move that when I do this with my body, it's going to help Lorna Kelly get sober in 1976. You know? she is go And then she's going to be at the international addressing people. He didn't have a thought. And that's the message, I think, of the heart, is to live bravely and to not choose the sure thing. And we never know by our gestures and by our simple acts the, the, the ramifications of that and how that ricochets to others. And um, we have no idea the power of risking. 
I had read this incredible quote from Helen Keller the other day, and she said that the sons of man cannot know security. Security is, is a myth we do not know. We think we've got it at one moment, and the next moment our entire lives can change. We just can't grasp it. It's, it's, we don't know security. And she said, Helen Keller said, you know, life is either a grand adventure or it's nothing. And, um, and I think, you know, for us, to risk is such the message and the language of the heart. It is so easy also to come into AA and to stay put. If you have home groups, one of the things I always say is, sit in a different place in the room. Don't always sit in the same chair. You know? <laughs> in the room from a different angle can be speak multitudes. And I want to thank you all for not choosing the sure thing, for calling your sponsors, for working the steps, for getting the alcohol out of your house, for being in Alcoholics Anonymous, because, because you didn't choose the sure thing. I'm here today, and I want to thank you all. I love you all, and I want to thank you all for my sobriety. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.